is the story of a Canadian hockey team in search of a world title. This is the dramatic story of Whitby Dunlops, representing Canada, traveling the broad Atlantic in Cunard's giant Queen Elizabeth to keep a rendezvous in Oslo, Norway, with the crack national teams of Europe. Hardly had the nose of this beautiful ship nudged into her berth at Southampton when the boys, neat and natty, in eye-catching hats and coats, were hustling down the gangplanks to take their first look at England. Four hours later, the Whitby Dunlop players were out practicing at Haringey Arena, London, and the news flashed through Europe that Canada had sent one of its most colorful and talented teams on the specific mission of ending Europe's two-year reign over international hockey. On to Oslo, on to that hockey showdown with Sweden, with Czechoslovakia, with the USA, and last but far from least with the mighty USSR. The high-stepping dunnies had rolled through England, Switzerland, and Sweden with ease and without loss, and had tuned into international rules in a two-game exhibition with the RCF Flyers stationed at Schweibrücken. Tension was rising as the Whitby team neared Oslo. The dunnies had played a Russian team in Toronto and had won. But they had seen these flying Ruskies beat some of the top teams in Canada. Ren Blair, the astute manager, and his boys knew that in a world title tussle where each game was sudden death, anything could happen. One slip, one false move, a lost temper, an accidental trip, a knee, or an elbow in the height of play could lose them a world championship. The flags of 26 nations fly in the Arctic winds as 7,000 robust hockey fans plow through the heavy snowstorm into the Jordal Amphi Stadium to see His Majesty King Olaf V of Norway take the skate pass of the eight competing nations, with Sweden as the reigning champions leading the procession. Then Canada. That snow must be worrying the Canadians plenty. Poland, a team without a chance, but a country sold on Canadian hockey. The Russians, Europe's bet for the world title. Czechoslovakia, rated highly by all Canadian observers. USA, unpredictable. Norway, the host nation with a king who enjoys his hockey. The teams line up and the stage is set to open the World Hockey Championships of 1958. J.F. Bunny O'Hearn calls on His Majesty immediately behind him to officially open the World Championship. It's a great honor to have with us this evening His Majesty the King of Norway who has so graciously consented to open the championship apollo. With these stores, I carry a very special carpet. With the murder of Antiochus. Is old man weather ganging up on this World Series? Snow is falling fast and heavy and the snow plow is working overtime to get the ice cleared for Canada's match against Norway. What do you say we drop down into the dressing room and meet some of the dunnies? Roy Edwards, young goalie with a fine pair of hands. Frank Bonello, fine two-way skater. Ted O'Connor, defenseman, rugged, hard-hitting. Gordon Miles, a natural scorer. Buzz Gagnon, big, fast, plenty of savvy. Alf Treen, a tough boy to get around. George Samalenko, dangerous in close. Bob Addersley, the man who leaves this boy uncovered at the crease is crazy. Harry Sinden, captain and inspiring holler guy. Sid Smith, ex-Maple Leaf star, player coach and sprinkled with stardust. George Goslin, stylish and smooth. Ed Richmond, a reliable standby, the veteran of the team at 32. Charlie Burns, a hustler, perpetual motion on ice. Jack McKenzie, the man with the shot. 
Stan Whalett, trainer and griller of steaks par excellence, they say. Stick boy, unofficial, incognito, a great booster to have around. Ren Blair, a good talker, a good manager. They don't come any shrewder. Wally Braben, assistant trainer. Fred Etcher, even a broken leg couldn't keep him away. Long John Henderson, standby goalie with a four-star rating. Norway was not expected to give Canada much trouble, and she didn't. But it was a proud moment for these determined Norwegians to meet the Canadians and hitch their wagons to the stars. The World Championship has its own game's anthem. Played before each match with both teams facing each other and at attention. Canada is on the right, wearing black and yellow sweaters with Dunlop Whitby on the front, Canada on the back, and the whole sweater dotted with maple leaves. King Olav V and 4,500 rooting Norwegians are on hand to cheer the home team to the full. His Majesty saw Norway take a 12-0 beating, but enthuses on the way Norway never gives up. Canada takes nothing for granted. Goal averages could decide the winner of the world title. Goal number 11 is a good piece of work with Buzz Gongo scoring through a mass of legs from a pass by Atta Boy Addersley. The crowd roar the Norwegians on, but Canada swarms to the attack and are in and around the Norwegian goal so often that the puck-slappy netminder should be seeing Canadians in his nightmares for the rest of his life. Sid Smith and Jack McKenzie are goal hungry. Both get three and are hunting down a fourth with no luck. Broden is hitting posts, Sam Malenko is shooting wild, and manager Blair is having cat fits, seeing open nets that his boys are missing, but shouldn't. Hattersley makes the boss feel a bit better when he takes Sam Malenko's pass to score the 12th and final goal just two minutes from time. Now with Poland and Norway in the bag, the boys vote for a change of scenery. Away with hockey, taxi to the Royal Palace, please. They don't come any friendlier than Charlie Burns and Ted O'Connor. And the guards are not holding Canada's pasting of Norway against them, so they talk and they laugh. Jean-Paul Lamorand likes the guard's hat. Canadian-Norwegian relations are getting a real boost. Focus as they now skate out against Sweden, the reigning champs. The stadium is full of Swedes who have come by plane, train and car to see their top team try to topple Canada. Crack of the whip, Canada attack. Before Sweden can say jeeper, Sid Smith gallops in to take Harry Sindon's pass and fire to the far corner for Canada's first goal. Lundell wraps himself around Jack McKenzie. Judo may be one way of stopping these fast-moving Canadians. Canada keep cool and stay on the puck. The Swedes are finding it hard to hold the dunnies as they mill around the goal, sidestepping, weaving, and shooting. The whole team is purring when Tom O'Connor latches on to a two-way pass from Burns and Lamoran to make the score 2-0. The alert referee checks the number to record the scoring. This game is in the bag. But the scoring spree goes on when Smith tips in Lamoran's shot from the point. Number four must have realized a Boston Bruins scout was in the stand for he starts to swing his weight. He jams. He rams. He trips. Again. And again. Peterson, Lundvall, and Nelson combined to open Sweden's account at the 6.20 mark. Canada won this one 10-2 after a little bit of everything.
Canada's back checking is one of the highlights of this game. They're really on the puck. Four checking all the time. Well, the game's over. There's been a few fights, but there's no hard feeling. The game ended, all was peace, and all were pals. Why, hello, son. Aren't you in the wrong neck of the woods? Nine out of ten Canadian experts will tell you they think the Czechs are the best hockey players in Europe, man for man, pound for pound. Substance was being added to this point of view when the Czechs the day before, this reckoning with Canada, tied Russia 4-4. Harry Sinden is a bit surprised when the Czech captain breaks ranks to hand the Canadian captain a pennant, an old continental custom. While Gagnon sits it out, opportunist Connie Broden takes McKenzie's pass to put Canada up 2-0. Czechs find the going rough as they hit the blue line. McKenzie, Burns and Goslin are zooming in and out. The team battles the Czechs through a scoreless second. Three nothing on a pass from Burns. They're a happy lot. Sinden makes it four. Goslin makes it five. The Czechs never let up, though the battle has been lost. The Dunny step up the pressure. They're a happy lot of warriors. The taste of victory and a third goose egg for Edwards gives them wings. But they're not easing up. The defense is still tough. into the boards. Still they come. And here's Goose Goslin sinking the sixth and final goal. Well assisted by Burns and Tom O'Connor. Canada are beating Czechoslovakia 6-0. Still they come and it's here where Czech goalie draws attention to his great ability. Dunny's manager even in the full sway of the game was reported to have muttered that cheating goal for the Czechs is one of the best netminders I have ever seen. Young Euroslav Narchel had plenty to do. He handled 47 shots to Edwards 14 and most of them were hot. Well, this hard fought, well won game is over. 350 Canadian soldiers and airmen from their bases in Germany liked everything they saw of their first match of the series. All hockey and no hooky is bad for world title seekers. So, the action a la Sid Smith and the subject matter speaks louder than words. Now, back to work. Now for the USA. The Americans with four players on the injured list could only field a skeleton team. Their star, John Mayasich, was out with pulled ligaments in the shoulder. The sun shone bright, and Canada goes to the end allotted to them before the game. But the Americans insist on tossing four ends. And Canada loses the first decision so far of the series. They lose the toss, and Edwards faces the sun. Crippled and undermanned as they were, the Americans showed the old fighting spirit. Regaccio in the American net is in top form, and in the words of the U.S. coach, if it hadn't been for him, we might have cashed 20 goals. Canada's playing a four-checking pattern. They never let the Americans break. Does this boy burn ever slow down? Fast, big, a great stick handler. The Continental fans rate him as sensational.
Sam Alenko wastes no time in starting the trek to victory when unassisted he finds a hole in Regasio's armor just one minute and 40 seconds from the start. Canada won. Canada's defense is like a stone wall. The time Americans can't jump it, can't go through it. Each time they try, they're bumped by Treen, Lamrand, and... Boy, did you see O'Connor get one of them. The Americans are tiring. The undermanned team is towing the strain, and Canada piles up the score. Blair has driven home the importance of goals, goals, goals. The title could be determined that way. Miles puts Addersley through to boost the score to 7-1. This was Connie Broden's afternoon out. The classy centerman put four pucks behind Regaccio. The Americans are tiring. There's no doubt about it. Canada's setting an awful pace. The loyal supporters are egging them on. The Americans have lost all hope of making a showing in this game. With a score 12-1, Marvin is only hoping no one else gets hurt so that he can field a team for tomorrow's game. The forwards have eased up, leaving the job of keeping the Americans out to the defensemen. Here's Ted O'Connor taking a breather. A four-star performer all the way. They're hitting, and they're hitting well in this game against America. Ren Blair, Canada's manager, dies a little in every game. He's a worrier. Even if the boys are good, he wants them better. Well, there's the score. Canada 12, USA 1. Those who stake their all on Canada are more than happy. This is it, Canada v. Russia. Kitchen Ice Hockey Association wish you all welcome to the last and deciding match in this championship between Canada and Soviet. The last game of the World Championships. And the title hinging on the outcome. A packed stadium, Russians from Moscow, Canadians from Whitby, RCAF airmen from Swybrooken, soldiers from the Canadian Armed Forces in Zeus, Germany, and headquarters London. The Canadians were the first to attack, but Tregobov cleared Gorgno's shot. The Russians counterattacked, and Cherfanov's shot skims over the net. How those Russians can skate. Their hustling style seems to be throwing the dunnies out of gear. Canada is feeling her way, trying to iron out the kinks and find a way to start rolling. But the Russians sense they have the Canadians off feet and are boring in. It's the Canadian defense of Treen, Lamoran, Ted O'Connor, and Harry Sinden who are holding the Flying Reds at bay. Neither side is getting many shots on target. 
Those that are dangerous are handled well by both Edwards of Canada and Pushkoff of the USSR. Both teams are wary of being caught up, and the back-checking is ferocious in its intensity and speed. There are no loafers or unmarked men in this battle of wits, stamina, and do-or-die struggle. And then it happens. Goose Goslin gets a penalty for boarding. It's a sad goose who skates to the penalty box knowing that this could be the most costly two minutes spent in a sin bin in the history of hockey. It's the first penalty of the game and the Canadian supporters have worry written all over their faces. They don't like it a bit. Now the Russians, the Russians are no dopes. This was opportunity knocking with a hammer. Lockteff shoots, Ted O'Connor blocks the puck, but it gets away, and Alexandrov pounces to fire the puck past Edwards as two minutes and 35 seconds shows on the clock. If ever a shiver of fear went through the Canadian rooters, it was at the seven-minute mark, when within three minutes, Broden, McKenzie, and Lamoran took penalties. It was a new Canada, a shrewder, sharper, more relaxed bunch of dunnies who skated out for the second period. The hockey is fast and Cherepanov tests Edwards, but Canada is freewheeling as of old. They're playing the puck and matching the Rusky stride for stride. Sid Smith misses in a gold mouth scramble. Pushkoff robs O'Connor and Burns when they're in on the Russian goalie alone. The Canadian rooters, still quiet with fingers crossed, waiting for Canada to bust out. The Canadians are turning on the pressure. Both sides are covering well. Passes are intercepted, but the checking is so close the goalies are not overworked. The Canadians want that tying goal. The Russians seem content to slow play down. This gives the initiative to Canada, and where every action indicates they're out to win or lose this game. The heck with playing for a tie to win. Let's go after the Russians. Let's skate them into the ice. Let's get that tying goal. Let's go, Dunny. Let's go, Dunny. Go. And that seems to be the silent, fervent wish of the crowd. Russians still holding that one nothing lead, the world title in their midst at this very moment. Any wonder if they're playing a bit of kitty bar the door hockey. They know that Canada needs only one false move to pounce. The 15,000 people know they're seeing a battle of wits between two crack teams, and no one at this stage can say who will skate off that ice tonight, the winner. But one thing is certain, Canada has the edge, if not the brakes, and the Russians who get too close to the crease get the treatment Excited, really tense. Edward makes a beautiful save, and a Russian goes catapulting into the net. Locating our circuit. The flick, flick and play Edward. on the bit, there's no doubt about it. Now, who's guessing who? At face-off, McKenzie moves in from Russian cover man and nearly gets his shot away. There it goes. Mr. Simpson, head of the Dunlop Rubber Company, looks on, just as excited as them all. And with his banner hat of gold, dunny gold. On the battle rages. Russia still leads 1-0, and there doesn't seem to be a break or a weakness in Russia's solid defense. Two Dunny 
guys are in the clear, in on Pushkov. Shoot! But no, he elects to pass, and the scoring chance is missed. Pushkov is hurt as the goal poster uprooted. Here was a great chance to tie the score. Should he have shot, or was he right in passing? Experts will argue this for years to come. Canada have had three scoring chances so far in this game, near the end of the first period when going right in. Early in this period when Tom O'Connor and Burns had Pushkov at their mercy, Sid Smith's bad miss at the goal scramble, and this, the two-man breakaway. Pushkov is sure a hard man to beat in close. Canada want one big break. Kalashtov is penalized for tripping. This may be the chink in the Russian armor. The dunnies are off the leash. Caution is thrown to the wind as they charge down on Pushkov. He saves, in close, and kicks the puck up the ice with his legs. Pushkov is sure mad. Going on yells for a penalty. Canadians hold Russian stick under his arms. The Dunnies are swarming around Pushkov, and boy, oh boy, Canada have scored. Canada have tied the score, and it was Bob Addersley who turned the trick with 18.40 gone in the second period from a scramble at the Russian crease. And a boy, Addersley, you can say that again and again. So it's number three, Ivan for interference. Canadians give a Russian a working over in the corner and play stops for a Russian to get attention. Canada come out for the third period full of get up and go. The score is 1-1, but Canada want to win, not tie this classic. That is what Blair says. That is what Sid Smith says. Locating our second, the second player. Even His Majesty King Olav senses the excitement and the prize that hinges on these last 20 minutes of play. The score is still 1-1 when the teams change for the last 10 minutes of play. watches from the bench. Hold it, hold it. Hold it, Canada have scored again. This time it's Connie Broden who's put the puck past Bushkov. Canadians are not as a rule demonstrative, but Broden gets hugged from his teammates. The Canadian rooters have smiles a mile wide. And the cheers can be heard down the main street of Oslo. Canada two, Russia one. sitting on the right of the king wearing a fur cap watches with keen interest and pleasure. 
But those who thought it was all over but the shouting were stopped in their tracks when Luck Kep took Sheriff and Oz pass to burn one past Edwards and tie the score at 2-2. have their following two a big cheer and the pitch battle resumed there's eight minutes to go and both teams hammer away at each other both take chances both playing daredevil take a chance hockey the canadians can't be stopped they turned on a burst of speed and cut through the russians Until Athersley takes Lamorant's pass to push the puck over the goal line. Another goal. Garnon takes a rolling puck from Addersley to make the score 4-2. Only 15 seconds after Addersley's second goal. Boy, are they a happy bunch of Canadians at Oslo. Canada 4, Russia, USSR 2. And just on a split second after the game ends, Canada score another. <clears throat> and to say that pandemonium broke loose is to put it mildly. The whole Canadian bench, supporters, coaches, and trainers pour out on the ice, dancing, hugging, kissing each other. Harry Sindon, the captain, weeps. Bobby Addersley breaks his stick with joy. Ren Blair stamps on his hat. What a moment of success. What a moment of success, I repeat. They wanted to keep these people off the ice. What a chance they had. Mr. President for the International East Hockey Forbund, we knew the others to come in Orange Welsh Mr. Mr. Aaron, the President of the International Ice Hockey Federation, will now present the prizes to the winning team. Uh, your Majesty, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, we have just seen a fitting and most exciting finish to our 1958 championships. It is now my privilege to present to the captain of the Canadian team the World Cup and to the captain of the Soviet team the European Cup. describe the happiness of this occasion. This is, in the words of Churchill, Canada's finest hour. Canadians didn't forget the boosting, the cheering, and the confidence and loyalty of their rabid supporters, Canadians from every part of the world. <laughs> 